1732. The internet, however, is a little bit younger. 1983, the internet, internet sprung onto the scene, but it wasn't until 1995 that it became commercially available for organisations like us to use and try and make money from. It's taken a while for the arts organisations in this country to really take a grasp of the internet. But one of the main problems that we have is sustainability. Technology sustainability in the digital space is quite difficult. Imagine having a website and six different apps and trying to maintain those on different content management systems. Not only is it costly from a platform perspective, but it's costly from a staff perspective to manage. And that's one of the challenges that we all have, but while at the same time keeping up with the pace of technology and the pace of consumer demand. The most recent recession has revealed to us the number of organisations and businesses that have gone under because they've not been able to stay innovative. One of the things that has changed everything for us was in 2006, Twitter came onto the scene. Social media web 2.0 has become to be known, really took hold. And from that point on, we had to start to try and keep up with the race of internet change. Back in 2010, we started work on our digital strategy. It was the first digital strategy for the Royal Opera House. And one of the important components of that strategy was innovation using open data and collaborative working. This enabled us to think about how we would use data differently in the future, but interestingly, we didn't know how we were actually going to do it. Web 3.0 and the Internet of Things came along, and that started us on a different type of journey, working with data and how that data can interact with itself and other types of data across the Internet. With that strategy, we've now moved forward and delivered our website online, but our old website was very different. Over 600 pages were static, and no dynamic content in that page meant those pages used to stagnate online and the website became unwieldy, unfindable and unsearchable. What we've done is we've changed that methodology and we've moved into a platform which has no content management system. We think of content being placed in its natural habitat. So take a video for example. Instead of putting a video into a video player which is bespoke or native to your website, put the video in the most natural place for it to sit online. Where would that be? The obvious choice would be YouTube. It's the same with photography. All of our photography is held in Flickr. All of our link throughs through Delicious and all of our sound through SoundCloud. Then use tagging and cross-tagging to bring all this data together in a semantic way. Our Head of Digital Development, Jamie Tetlow, has been leading a project to look at how we use the Internet of Things and develop our new website and our platform going forward. We're now going to talk to Jamie about the Internet of Things, what it's all about and how we're using it here at the Royal Opera House. So we're here now with Jamie Tetlow um, and we're in the uh, magnificent um, Victorian Auditorium here at the Opera House which you can't really see because they've turned the lights off, they're setting up for Don Giovanni tonight um, and you can probably hear in the background um, a harpsichord being tuned as well as they get ready for this evening's performance. Um, but we're here to talk about digital stuff so um, Jamie, I talked a minute ago about our old static website and why that didn't work. Can you expand on that and tell us what what wasn't quite right about the old website? When I arrived at the, um, at the Opera House, the, the website was powered by a uh, content management system that was primarily been implemented to build pages. And that was, that was what it was put in place for. It was a tool to make pages and therefore teams around the Opera House made pages. The problem that presented was that there was no structure to the information that was being put on, on our website. And there was nothing intrinsically linking that information together. So we ended up with a, a website that was fitting the structure of the departments, and something that wasn't very user-centered and didn't relate to the way that our audience viewed the stuff that we make. So I suppose that comes back to why content management systems were invented and um, thinking back when the internet first came along, we, we created web pages. If you wanted to create a web page, you needed a technical developer to do it. And content management systems were invented and then that meant anybody could do it. And then as a result, especially here, but I'm sure everybody sees a sprawl of pages where everyone has no control and it, it keeps to grow and it snowballs and it becomes out of control. Mm -hmm. So what did we do to try and fix that? Well, we had a look at... The first thing we tried to do was to think about the things that our audience were interested in. And certainly for the Opera House, we understand that the thing that our audience are interested in, are interested in are our productions. That's our core intellectual property that we have here. So we made sure that we modelled our data around our productions. And then the other types of things that people are interested in that relate to that. So, for instance, the actual performances of those productions. Um, also, the people that are appearing in those productions. And these are all the things 
that our audience want to know about. And therefore, we modeled the data, create structures around the relationships between those things, and began to build a model and a dynamic website on top of those structures. So that kind of brings me to two questions. The first question is, how does that link with the Internet of Things for us? And the second and obvious question is, what is the Internet of Things? Well, the phrase that you used earlier was about the semantic web. Mm. So, first of all, the thing to think about with that is, what, what does semantics mean? Semantics is about the meaning of language. And so that's what we're trying to do with the, the, the semantic web movement. It's about understanding the meaning of things, uh, creating the structure of things and their relationships, and trying to expose that over the web. And so what did we use to, you know, when we've talked about this before, people, people say, well, you've not got a content management system, so what holds the data? Where, where did we put the data and, and how? Well, when, when I joined, there was that we, we have our existing ticketing enterprise systems. Tessa Tura. We know, yeah. obviously, Tessa Tura. Yeah. That's, why we're, that's why we're here talking. Um, so we had that system already, but then we produced this very fat middleware content management system to extract data from there and turn it into web pages. So the first thing that, that I did when I arrived was to say, we don't need this content management system in the middle. Tessa Tura is our data structure. We have we have the layers there to create the information that we need. So we ex extracted that content management system from the middle layer and just created a dynamic application at the web front end that connected to our Tessitura data that was being structured. And so therefore, all the data is managed directly in Tessitura. And so it's this cross-tagging that is the key in terms of creating a relationship between the content, whatever it be, in Flickr or in YouTube, to our information and our kind of narrative to that content in our CMS, which is Tessitura in yes, this case. Yes, the thing, the thing that we identify clearly with uh, any of those platforms on, out there on the web, platforms like YouTube, platforms like Flickr, Delicious, is that the thing that they have all in common is tagging. And the, another thing that they all offer is they offer open data APIs. So for us, we looked at our own content and we devised a tagging scheme that identified our objects, so a production we have its title, and we have the person responsible for creating it. This evening, Caspar Holton for Don Giovanni. So we take those two keywords, tag our content with those two keywords, and then we're able to cross-pollinate all that information and all that content back onto our website and produce really interesting, engaging experiences for our customers. So we're leveraging the power of these freely available application program interfaces to do things for us. Is it easy to do? I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily easy, mm -hmm. but actually being able to put your content onto those platforms is absolutely trivial for anybody to yeah. do. Plenty of people are doing it already. It's just about seeing where the powers lie in those platforms and, and then thinking that extra, extra bit hard about how can you actually begin to make those connections between your content. So we've done all that. We went through a web launch and, and our, we've used some semantic approaches and methodologies to enable us to launch our new website. And it's... It's certainly made an impact in terms of the numbers of people that have come into the website and the stories we're able to tell with content. What are the key benefits, do you think, from taking a semantic approach over a CMS approach, other than the obvious things around being able to automate the data integration? Well, there's the automation, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, cost savings. In order to maintain our own systems to, to power photographs, to power videos, would be very costly. Also, those systems may not be able to scale very well. We wouldn't be able to keep up with the advancements that, that those platforms like YouTube and Flickr are obviously every day increasing in terms of their power and complexity. Um, and then the next steps that we're looking at are, are going to in terms of those platforms is we've, we've made the, taken the benefit of, of, of the open data that those platforms provide. And now we're thinking about how can we turn this on its head and provide open data back out onto the web. So this is exposing our own data in an open way so anybody can use it and grab it. Yeah, absolutely. So we've taken that the, the structure that YouTube and Flickr offer for, for around our types of assets that we're interested in, but we've brought them into our own website and cast them through the lens of our productions, and now we want to turn that back out onto the web. So we're trying to find ways that we can create our own website as an API for people to engage with our content and begin to start interacting with our content in interesting ways. And do you think the fact that we've got all of our content up on YouTube and Flickr, etc., actually helps that kind of symbiotic relationship of push it, pushing us up the search rankings, giving us extra credibility online, if you like, managing or exploiting the equity of 
sites like Flickr and YouTube. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely trying to complete the loop of, 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 of link ranking by adding content to platforms where photographers are, where video makers are, exposing our content there, making sure that it's linked back to our own content and then linking back out again, completing those loops, completing those circles. That's the kind of things that search engines love to find out about. I suppose the obvious question is we're, we're placing our content out there in other people's hands. Um, what happens when, say, Facebook changes their API? How do we manage that? That's part of the risk that we have to take on ourselves. So uh, we keep an eye on, on, on where those platforms are going and make sure that we're aware of the various uh, upgrades that are, that are coming out. And if we need to move or we need to shift, then, then we can do that and we make sure that we have the resources in-house to be able to do that. Um, but that's, that's part of the risk cost-benefit analysis that we have to do with, with choosing to go with these platforms. And so we've done all that, which is, sounds fantastic and is fantastic. Um, what's next? You know, in terms of, we've talked a lot about Wikipedia, for example, it's the largest non-search website on the planet, pretty much, you know, and leveraging their sort of real estate and the, the kind of content they now have available there is absolutely phenomenal. And it's definitely a lot of opera and ballet in there. How are we, how, what are we thinking around those kind of platforms that we're not yet joined up with but are freely available? Yeah, so we know that obviously Wikipedia is the most amazing information resource on, out there on the web. So um, one thing that we've been doing recently is, is we've been looking to contribute to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in much the same way that we contribute all our content to Flickr, all our content to YouTube and put it out there onto the web. We've been uh, engaging members of our content team to contribute content to Wikipedia to make sure that they're not trying to take over Wikipedia, but just contribute where there's information that we, we are the, the owners of and we want to provide it to those articles that are there on Wikipedia. And once again, we'll be looking to how can we harness that information to pull it back onto our, our website so that our website becomes, again, a gateway to more and more information about the world of ballet and opera. Mm. And it's a really there's a really interesting one to look at, which is Tosca on Wikipedia. It's one that we've contributed to heavily. And I think there's a... Um, somebody in there called Opera Valley Rose, which is actually us contributing. And if you look, you can look behind a whole conversation that we've had with other Wikipedians about our contributions and what's going to work and what's not going to work. So it, I think it was an interesting learning process putting that together. You absolutely have to work on, in, on the terms of, uh, of the Wikipedians, uh, otherwise you, it's going to be a losing battle, there's no point. It's, it, 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 this is about a conversation. Um, it's about exposing that conversation to the world and trying to increase, increase the level of information. So can I ask you a little bit about the open data and who's going to use this data that we now expose in XML and JSON to, to the internet? Who, who's going to benefit from that? Um, well really, it, it, it could be anyone hmm. um, and that's kind of the key point is we're trying to create an API for any developer out there, any other cultural organisation that's interested in the kind of information that we are exposing. It could be any event listing uh, company that wanted to try and re-aggregate our information with the resources that they have. So anywhere that they can find connections with the things that we do, um, they're welcome to our data to, to take it uh, and consume it into whatever device they want. So the, the, the key point behind that open data is that by exposing that data, um, out onto the web, allowing other people to consume that information uh, and make sure that there are the correct links there back to our, ourselves is that we become the canonical source, potentially the canonical source for that information. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that if we decided to build a native app in, say, an Apple store or an Android store, we could also plug into that data for ourselves so we don't have to recreate that data twice. Absolutely, absolutely. This is the kind of the information that we just want to be out there. It's public information. There's no point in trying to lock it down. And yet, if anybody, if, if we wanted to build an app, if somebody else wanted to build an app on, on, top, of, on top of our information, then they're absolutely free, free to do so. So, um, in summary then, the Royal Opera House has worked to develop a, would you say, Web 3.0 ready website? Mm -hmm. And using cross-tagging and data interoperability, build something that is more fit for the future and something that we can develop over time and has data in a structured, meaningful place. And in doing that, we've removed the need for expensive to own and to maintain content management systems. Exactly.